Finger Lakes does manufacture all its products in the U.S. We're one of a couple of companies that still are U.S. owned, U.S. manufactured. We make cooled CCD cameras, filter wheels, and focusers. In terms of cameras, we make the ProLine, which is a bigger model, heavier, longer back focal distance. It cools a little bit better than the MicroLine, and it has power and USB for peripherals. The MicroLine is a relatively small camera, short back focal distance when we use it with small sensors. It's about three pounds, but it still cools to about 60 degrees below ambient. The Hyperion is a version of the MicroLine where the electronics have been moved off to the side, so it has a short front to back distance. Not commonly used in astronomy, it's more commonly used for life science applications. We make 14 different filter wheels. This chart's a little bit obsolete, but we do make a lot of different filter wheels for two inch filters, two inch square filters, 50 millimeter filters, 65 millimeter filters. We also make high speed filter wheels. This is the center line. It has two five position carousels for two inch square filters with a center aperture so it's balanced as you move your telescope around. The other filter wheels we make where you have the aperture off to the side, as you move the scope around, it's gonna uh, flop the weight around. Uh, we recently introduced a 20 position version of this, but it's a 24, 25 millimeter, so it's 10 in each. Uh, one advantage of this filter wheel is that you can put, for example, a polarizer in one of the wheels and filters in the other, or you can just leave two of the positions open if you just want to have one filter showing and the other clear. We do make high speed filter wheels, again, not typically used for astronomy, though we do have a few customers. These change filter positions in as short as 23 milliseconds for the six position or 30 milliseconds for the 10 positions. So that can keep up with a video camera. The Atlas Focuser, very precise, very robust. We rate them for 25 pounds to carry 25 pounds of equipment. We test them to 40. It travels about a third of an inch, 105,000 steps, 85 nanometers per step. That pretty much ends the commercial message. But I'm just giving you a context. Sensors, that's what I came to talk about. We have two charts, both of which you can also find them on our homepage at the bottom of the page. The one on the right is numbers, the one on the left is the actual physical size of the imaging area. The two charts are matched, they're color coded. The far left, the red there, is front illuminated, full frame devices. The middle, black, is interline, and the far right is back illuminated. The very large sensors, like the large blue one on the upper right, that's a back illuminated sensor, extremely high sensitivity. You're talking about a $120,000 camera, down to the very bottom cameras that are much smaller sensors. You can see a huge ratio. All of those cameras are supported in any of the three models, with the exception of the two larger sensors. Now, what's the difference? The most frequent question that I was asked yesterday is, what's a front illuminated, what's a back illuminated? Silicon creates electricity by the incidence of light, and if you didn't do anything else to it, you'd have a solar cell, because you wouldn't care where the light hit or where the electricity was created. But CCDs charge couple devices, they put a gate structure or multiple gate structures over the top of it, and then they put a voltage on it, and that creates a well down into the sensor. So where the photon hits and creates an electron, the electron gets trapped, and that's how we create a picture. The problem is those gate structures are typically made of polysilicon, Polysilicon is not transmissive, so the light that hits where that gate is gets lost. So a long time ago, about 30 years ago, somebody had the idea, what if we flip this thing over and grind down the substrate so that the CCD is now only 15 microns thick? The gates will be on the back, they'll still create a well, but they won't be blocking the light. So that's called thinned or back illuminated. Those are substantially more expensive because of this grinding down process, and there's a low yield, and I think partly marketing. <laughs> but those cameras typically cost three to four times more expensive for the same size of sensor, the same uh, area covered by the sky. However, okay, why would you do that? The quantum efficiency, QE, is the ratio of the amount of light to the amount of electrons created. So if you have 100 photons that arrive and you create 100 electrons, that's 100% quantum efficiency. If you have 100 photons arrive and you only create 50 electrons, that's 50% quantum efficiency. You have to be careful when you're looking at QE curves on camera manufacturers because some of them use relative QE curves. They take whatever the peak is for the sensor, place it at one, and then everything else is relative to that one, but you don't know what one means. We only use absolute QE curves, so you'll see 100% or an 80% at the top, and then there's the actual numbers, the ratio of the light to how many photons create electrons. Interline transfer is the other architecture, the black one in the middle, where you have half the pixel, a little bit more than half the pixel, covered with a metal mask, and it's a storage diode, so it's not gathering any light. And the other half of the pixel is a photodiode, and that's where the light's gathered and stored. These kinds of sensors are shuttered, so-called electronic shuttering, by moving 
the electrons from the photodiode to the storage diode. In this picture, it's called the vertical register. Notice that the vertical register is underneath the gate, so all that light's blocked. How do you recapture some of that light? You put a micro lens over each pixel and you focus the light down on the photodiode. What you can do with an inner line transfer, the microsecond that you move the charge from the photodiode into the vertical register, you can immediately begin the next exposure called simultaneous readout and expose. These are typically used for surveillance applications or machine vision, something that requires frame rate and continuous exposure. They're also used in astronomy because you get a little bit more bang for your buck for two reasons, one of which is uh, they're mass produced for the other markets that are much higher volume than the full frame sensors. And the second of which is if you've got a remote application, these don't require an electromechanical shutter for, to shutter every exposure. You would only use the electromechanical shutter for something called a dark, which is an exposure without any light, so that you can do calibrations. Electromechanical shutters are also slow. This is from the data sheet for the 65 millimeter shutter that's pretty commonly used in the industry. You can see that its total window time, it's drawn in a circle there, about 120 milliseconds, so that's fairly slow. 45 milliseconds to open, about 50 milliseconds to close, and you have some dwell time, whereas you can shift the charge in a few microseconds with an interline. That's a QE curve. The top curve is a back illuminated sensor. The middle curve is a Sony 694, and the bottom left that's slightly red in this is a 16070. You can see the huge difference in their sensitivity. Again, this is an absolute QE curve. Okay, little rule of thumb for matching telescopes to pixel size. If you divide the focal length in millimeters by 200, say 1200 millimeters divided by 200, you get a number, six, which is the number of microns on the CCD for one arc second of sky. You guys can argue amongst yourselves how much arc seconds you want per pixel, but that at least gives you the number where you can figure it out. These are some slides of pictures taken with our cameras. We're not cheating here. <laughs>